Jai Jinder everyone, once again. Uh, welcome to the last and seventh day of the position series on Jainism Simplified. Uh, to introduce our speaker, I welcome Sri Dilip Ji Shah, a past chairman of China and current president of China International Overseas Relations Committee. Dilip sir, over to you. Jai Janendra, for the 2023 position, China is very happy to present first global position per hosted by Dr. Bipin Doshi. The theme for the series of lectures is Jainism Simplified. Today is the la last Parishan lecture by Dr. Bipin Doshi. From tomorrow, the selection parva will begin and Jaina lectures series will continue by Shastri Swanubhuti Jain in the mornings and in the evening, in the evening, Lectures will be provided by Sri Manish Modi. The schedule and signing information is available in Jaina daily newsletters and on Jaina website. I urge everyone to partake these lectures as they really can expand our understanding of Jain Dharma. Today, Dr. Bipin Doshi will speak on the economics of Bhagwan Mahavir and answer some of the questions posted by the listeners. I'm delighted to present Dr. Bipin Doshi. Sadar Jai Jinendra, today is the second last day of Purusha in USA and the last day of Purushan in India. First of all, I'll speak in Hindi. I hope ki sab sata ma rahe. Aap me se kai logo ne kisi prakar ka tap kiya hoga. To aap ke upar dev guru ki krupa rahe. आज ये लास्ट लेक्चर है तो सबसे पहले तो मैं कमत कामना आप सबकी क्षमा याचना करता हूं अगर जाने अनजाने में से कोई गलती मेरी हो गई हो तो अगेन आई सिंसियरली थैंक ऑल ऑफ यू for this Swadhyay. I don't consider this as a lecture. This is something by which we understand each other and the concept of Jainism, which I have tried to put it into a simple format. I would like to be very clear that whatever has been said over here is all which has come to us from the teachings of our Tirthankaras, Gandharas and Acharyas. I might have presented into the I might have presented it into a very simple form. But at the same time, let me express that we are all courier of the divine knowledge which is given to us by our Tithrakaras. And you know what is the original value of the person who has created it and what is the value of a courier. So please consider me as a courier or a postman to express what Tithrakar Paramatma has told us. Today to start with I'll answer some of the questions which were asked. Probably I'll answer most of the questions which were asked. And then I'll touch upon the economics of Tirthankar Mahavir. Because 
you know our community is considered to be most educated community community and most resourceful community this is not only in india but even in usa though we are very small our community is considered as most affluent community most educated community and obviously most resourceful community so it's very interesting that we did not go abroad or we did not spread all over the world to spread our religion actually we went all over the world for our business or for the advancement of our profession and many things like that but wherever we went we took our roots there today if you see in usa there are so many temples i am uh, celebrating parushan parva in harrisburg and if you see the enthusiasm of the people over here you really feel that though people stay in usa or many other countries we haven't forgotten our roots so that's something which we are proud about and that's something which we cherish and i'm sure that in country like usa or even in the places many places of india we have been able to preserve our culture our tradition and our principles so to start with some of the questions which are asked i'll just uh, try to answer them the first question was about the colors in our symbol yes there are five colors in our symbol this color represents represents five colors which we assign to navkar mantra let me tell you that this is a creation of some of us because there is no agamic reference of navkar mantra having any color but yes when you make something colorful we like it so uh, it does not have any agamic references or does not have any scriptural support but we have adopted this five colors for our five pancha parmeshti or five virtues being the second uh, question is about the root vegetables of course this questions come very often wherever we go why we should not eat root vegetables as per our scripture we say that uh, these root vegetables are ananta kaya jivas that means there are infinite soul in these root vegetables sometimes people argue that uh, what's the difference between the number of the soul in the leaves and fruits and in the roots so we don't have a scientific uh, uh, clarity on this but uh, in the beginning i told you that we should always keep our mind open because whatever our tithankaras have said there is some meaning behind it the second thing is that the roots are growing against the energy of the universe that is sun and it is said that that which grows toward the sun has a positive energy and that grows against the sun or without the sunlight has negative energy the third point is when we are eating the roots we are basically destroying the whole plant and that's considered to be a uh, intense violence when we take out the roots we also hurt so many living beings actually two cents to four cents living beings so again that's something which we call more violence but lastly which is very appealing to all of us is that when we think about any food as a doctor we classify them as carbohydrate protein fat how much mineral it has how much vitamin c it has so this is probably a chemical classification or the chemical structure of the food which we eat but when we talk it in terms of our spirituality or uh, in terms of our dharma 
we classify the food into three categories sattvic rajasic and tamasic sattvic is one which uh, enhances your enlightenment rajasic is one which uh, brings down your enlightenment and tamasic is one which makes you aggressive even this classification is given in our uh, vedic granth like gita so potatoes onion garlic and some of the other items are considered to be tamasic that means it can damage your enlightenment make you aggressive and probably will inhibit your growth in the path of uh, moksha or spiritual advancement and that's why we say that don't eat root vegetables however let me be little clear about this that our religion is not only to be focused on what we eat and what we don't eat our religion has to be more focused on the kashaya or four kinds of evil passions there is anger ego deceit and greed to control them is more important than giving so much importance to our food habits this is something that we have to be very clear because many time it happens that our youngsters or the youth feel that we have made it our religion as a religion of kitchen or the religion of restaurant i'll give you a simple example we observe tithi maybe beach pacham atham gyaras or chaudas the concept of tithi is very simple that two days tirthankar says that okay you do whatever you want to do i mean not that you do whatever you want to do but yes uh, you can uh, eat what you want to eat and you can you know may not be necessary that uh, you take lot of controls in your life but at least if you have enjoyed your two days the third day should be a day of restraint a day of sanyam unfortunately what we have what has happened that on the tithi day we only follow one thing not to eat green, not to eat green vegetables actually it is not so on the day of tithi you are supposed to control all your passions you are supposed to control all your food habits you have to eat less if possible do ekashna or biashna or upvas you have to keep away keep yourself away from any uh, violent activities you have to restrain yourself from entertainment so friends when you follow tithi not only think that you are not supposed to eat green vegetables that's not only one thing it's a very very small part of your uh, religious activity so uh, that that part is very important for us this is about the root vegetables somebody asked me that who controls the law of karma there has to be some divine power jainism believes that if the whole universe is acting or is monitored by the law of nature and the law of karma itself is a law of nature there is nobody to govern on the law of nature the whole nature is considered to be self governed so law of karma is a self governed like other law of nature there is no divine power to decide good karmas and bad karmas and whose karma and when and all that one question is asked again on uh, that how do i know how many karmas i have bonded it all depends on the type of the activity which you have done on the intensity with which you have done that activity the kind of the activity so when we do any bondage of karmas four things will happen one what kind of karmas are bonded that is nature 
how much they are bonded that is pradesh with what what intensity they are bonded that is called rasa or anubhaga and the fourth one sthiti for how long those karmas will remain with our soul before they come under the fruza so this is about the question about the karmas there is a question of veganism see traditionally we were we are using milk and if we go to the ancient literature the milk which we were milking from the cow there was no violence to the cow it was like a mother who gives you the milk we never used to take away the milk of the uh, calf first you know the the child or the calves will take the milk and then remaining milk we used to get and there was no business of milk at all it's only maybe 100 years back that we started selling the milk and we started preparing various items from the milk gradually it happened that the demand for the milk started increasing and when this demand started increasing the production was to be increased and when the production was to be increased how do we do that so that there came a real dairy business or dairy production where we make our cows pregnant more often more than what their body can really take up we give them the antibiotics we give them the hormones we do the artificial insemination and many times after doing the artificial in, uh, insemination we instead of get instead of getting the cow we get the male one and all these are sent to the slaughter houses even the cow which stops giving you the or which is, which stops being present uh, pregnant and stop giving us the milk we send them to the slaughter house so there is a clear nexus between the increase in the milk production and the increase in the slaughter house so the cruelty which is happening you know even if you see that how the cow's milk is pumped uh you know the kind of the machines which are used kind of the atmosphere in which they are kept it's really a cruel method of getting the milk but what is more important is that right from our childhood we are very wrongly taught that milk is a complete food actually i as a doctor can definitely tell you that milk is not a complete food and there are so many other alternatives of the milk which we may use in avoid milk however why do we at least you know can stop things like cheese paneer ice cream softy and so many other uh, milk product if not the milk because let's understand one thing more the milk production more animals will be sent to the slaughter house so this is about veganism it's very important to note that uh, at present at so many places we find the concept of veganism i remember that uh, last year there was a convention by the young Amer young jain americans and the condition of the person who sponsored the whole program was that the food should be only vegan even in jaina convention it is seen that uh, special vegan food is prepared 
for all those who follow veganism. It's very difficult for us to make people understand about the non-vegetarianism. But the concept of veganism is spreading very fast. And obviously, veganism means no animal product. It includes, non, it includes the non-vegetarian food. So I think we as a Jain should propagate veganism as much as possible. The next question is about samyakatva. What is samyakatva? Roughly you can say it is samyak darsha. The simple meaning of samyakatva is right view. If you take Haribhadra Suriji Maharasa, Hemchandracharya, even uh, uh, if you go in a recent past, Srimad Rajchandra, Kanji Swami, if you read their literature, they very clearly say that the your spiritual progress does not start unless and until you have samyakatva or the right view, rational view. Some people uh, translate this as a rational view. Let's understand that samyakatva is possible only and only to the five sense living being. That is for the human, for the celestial being that is deva, for the narkis that is hellish being because they are all five sensed organism, or five sensed uh, beings and also to some of the Tyrians who are five sensed beings. But, okay, how do we get it? The simplest way of samyakatva is a Shubha Manobhava. Shubha, auspicious, Manobhava, auspicious activities of the mind leads us to samyakatva, as simple as that. And that's where our journey of spiritual progress starts. But very important part is, it's only human being who can progress further from samyakatva to the fifth gunasthan. Samyakatva is considered to be the fourth gunasthan. And in fifth gunasthan, only human being and there are some rare exceptions where Tiryans can go to the fifth gunasthan. Narki and celestial being or devas, hellish being and celestial being cannot cross the fourth gunasthan. So it is said that our spiritual progress will start only after samyakatva. Even the bhava, bhava of, of the life span, the, the lives which we describe in our literature, maybe about Tirthankar Mahavir or maybe about Parshanath. So first bhava of Tirthankar Mahavir is considered to be that of Naisar. And by doing Vayavach of Sadhu Bhagwant, Naisar gets the Samyakatva. That means, again, the most auspicious mental activities or mind that leads to samyakatva. If we take the example of Tirthankar Parsanath, he, though it was the mistake of Kamat, he goes to Kamat and asks for forgiveness. Again, this is also the best example of having the purity of the mind. So once the person is pure in his mind, he starts getting this virtue of samyakatva. The next question is about the five kartavyas. Hemchandracharya has described many kartavyas, especially during the time of Padushana. But out of these many duties, kartavya means duties, five duties are considered to be most important. And the first of them is amari pravartan. Amari pravartan. A is no. Mari is violence, pravartan is to propagate. That means during these seven days of our parishanas, we will follow the non-violence, we will make others to follow the non-violence and we also propagate this non-violence throughout the year. So we learn in this particular time to propagate, to follow, make others to follow 
the concept of non-violence because that is the base of our our dharma or our tradition. I always tell that if we take out two words from our dictionary, non-violence, that is ahinsa and attachment, that is parigraha, aparigraha. Then you know the the Jainism becomes very. I mean, it doesn't remain that as a special dharma. The second kartavya is called sadharmic bhakti. What is a sadharmic bhakti? Has to be understood very well. Nowadays, what happens that when we help the people who are Jain, we consider that as a sadharmic bhakti. Fine, that is fine. Any family who is in distress, we help them. Any child who needs a certain uh, educational assistance, we help them. So these are all the activities where we try to help our people who are Jains. And that's what we consider Sadharmi Pakti. It is also said by our Acharyas that in one side of the balance, you keep all your rituals of the whole life your Samaik, your Pratikraman, your Upvas and everything. And on the other balance, other side of the balance, you keep help Sadharmik Bhakti of one person. And that is more meritorious than all your rituals. That much of an importance is given to Sadharmik Bhakti. But we all should know the history of Sadharmik Bhakti. It is said that in past, suppose there is a small place and there are 100 families staying together. It was essential that all the families do Shata Avashyak. That means a Jain must do six essential activities in the day. Samaik, Chauvisanto, that is Dirtankar Puja, Guru Vandana, if the Guru is there. The fourth is Pratikraman. The fifth is Pachkan and the sixth is Kausak. These are considered to be the six essential activities which every Jain has to follow. But it so happened, it was observed by some of our Acharyas, that some people cannot even do this because they need to have their livelihood. They have to go for work or they have to work from somewhere and they have no time to follow these six essentials. And that's place, that was the time when Acharyas advised other people that please take care of those families so that they can do the six essentials or the six essential activity which Jain is supposed to do. So friends, if I help anybody for the sadharmic bhakti, I wouldn't use the word even help because help, it's not a help, it's a bhakti. So if I do sadharmic bhakti of Mr. X, it should not be only for the education. It should not be only for providing him some, uh, you know, uh, food item and all that. I must see that by doing that sadharmic bhakti, the family follows the six essentials which he is supposed to follow as the Jain. This is the foundation of Sadharmi Pakti. And that's why it is said that in the balance, one side you keep all your rituals and the other side you, you keep Sadharmi Pakti, that side is heavier. So this is about the second Kartavya, that is Sadharmi Pakti. The third Kartavya is fasting for three days. Atamno Vas. Now why this? Again, we purify our soul during these days, but it's very essential also to purify our body or the sharir. Three days fasting is very important. I as a doctor can tell you that first day when you fast, you become very uncomfortable. The first day is little difficult. The second day is very difficult because second day is the day when you start bringing out all your toxins which you have collected. The whole body goes into the, you know, such a uh, vigorous metabolic activities by which 
you try to throw out all your you know usually the person gets vomiting unless you know unless the person is habituated to do this but if he is doing it first time a lot of toxins come out it's good if there is a vomiting on the second day and if you are very com- uncomfortable there is a severe headache these are the good signs that your toxins are coming out and again third day whatever remaining toxins are there will come out slowly so doing three days fasting has not only the spiritual significance but it has a lot of significance of your body cleansing your body so this is the third activity or the third duty which we are supposed to do during the parushan again let me tell you whatever we are doing parushan is a training so that we have to continue throughout the year it's not that you do it only during the parushan you know we do a lot of uh, you know restrain not to eat this and not to eat that all for uh, seven days and i uh, let me tell you frankly that after the parushan is over sometimes people say hi parushan have gone and you see the restaurant special in mumbai i observe full of jains the next sunday after the parushan you find mostly the restaurants are crowded with jains that's not right actually parushan teaches you not to do that and what we are doing we are considering these as a forceful you know fisting on us and then you know start doing something which we are not supposed to do so all these kartavyas are supposed to be learning which we have to continue throughout the year the fourth kartavya is known as chaitya paripati that means during that period uh, you uh, go around uh, uh, to the 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 temples which are there around and also the sadhu bhagavans which are present and pay your respect to them somebody asked that whether i can do it for more than 3 days or not my advice is very simple that when you do fasting do it gradually you can start with one day then two days then three days then eight days and then you know more than that whatever you want to do it there some people who do it you know they have never done fasting and they do it for eight days fine okay because of your will power and because your body is so strong you withstand all that for seven or eight days i mean eight days it's good i'm not denying that but idea is not that you do a thai once and then forget that throughout your life idea is that you should do upavas or fasting recurrently you learn it during the parushan and then every month at least you should have a fasting for two days or sometime consecutively for two days or three days fasting cleanses your body and most most important thing along with fart, fasting daily you should try to follow chauvyar sometime it is difficult so if for chauvyar i would like to give two advice one is that many times you may not be able to do chauvyar very strictly as per the law of sunset which ideally you should do but even if you can't do that try to see that you eat as early as possible and keep your stomach fasting at least for 12 to 14 hours because that is good for your health second very important thing when you are doing chauvyar see that your morning food you take at least by 10 or 11 o'clock because there should be a difference i mean there should be a gap of at least 6 hours from your morning meal to the evening meal i have found people eating the meal or the lunch at about 2:30 and gulping the food at 5:30 or 6 o'clock during the winter this is again not hygienic the third thing there are some people who need water at night so instead of doing chauvyar you can do tvr there is nothing wrong i mean don't feel that tvr is less important than the chauvyar there are people there are profession there are diseases where the water may be required during the night time also so in case you cannot do chauvya do tvr so this is something about the uh, about the chatna upvas sorry chaitya paripati and chatna upvas uh, this was the question which was asked right now on the chat box and the finally kshamapna kshama virasya bhushna obviously 
again, why do we do Kshamapna? Kshamapna is not a ritual. Kshamapna is not a custom. Kshamapna is not just a formality. Kshamapna has to come from within. Unless and until it doesn't come from within, it has no value at all. See, today only I started receiving Pichami Dukdam and my God, there will be about 100 messages. I don't know many people who they are and they'll start sending you the messages. For Kshamapna, it is to clean your mind. It is to clean your heart. It is to make yourself a little lighter than what you were. In Gujarati, I used to read, Ha pastao vipula jaranu swargati utaryu che papi tema dubaki daine punya sali bane che. To err is human, but to ask for forgiveness is divine. I'll give you a small instance about uh, Nelson Mandela. When Nelson Mandela was released from the jail, he was asked, what will you do about the people who harassed you, who tortured you in the jail? And he nicely answered that by keeping a grudge against those people, I might come out of the physical jail, but I will be in the mental jail and I don't want to be in a jail again. This was Nelson Mandela. Obviously, we know so many stories in all our literature about Kshamapna. We always say Kshama Virasya Pushanam. So try to understand that this is not just a formality. The second thing which I would like to tell you, we usually use the word Michami Dukdam. Actually, this is not a right word. The meaning of Michami Dukdam is Mere Duskrutya Mithya Thao. Mara Duskrutya Mithya Thao. So here we are not asking for kshamapna. We are only repenting. So if you really want to ask for kshamapna, instead of michami dukdam, you should always use the word kamat khamna. Or you can say mitti me savve bhuve su veram mazam na kenai. So that is how you should ask for kshamapna. But many times we only say michami dukdam. Obviously, traditionally, this word has become so popular that we even don't realize that this is not the right wing, right uh, uh, meaning of Shamapna. Then I am asked that can I join, join military? I would say yes. To protect your country is a kind of a profession. It's a kind of an activity. So you should not think of, uh, I mean, see, in military also, like you can join as, you know, military as a doctor, you can join military as a technician, you can join military as a so many other profession. Mostly the people who are in military or who are in the police and those who are Jains, they have a different kind of duty. So uh, we cannot say that don't go for the military because it's a necessity of the society. It's a necessity of the country. And why should we keep away? I mean, why should we think that others should only help us to protect? Why Jain community should why Jain community should not participate in the defense of our country? So I, as a person, would always say that yes, you should join military. And you know, rarely there are war. War is not so common. Just don't think that you know everybody who goes into the military has to you know daily go on fighting. So. Uh, a, a Jain, there is no bar on Jain uh, uh, joining the military. What is the, the another question is that suppose I have a desire for moks, will that not be a kashai because it is a desire? As I mentioned that any desire is kashai. So if I have a desire for moks, can it be considered as kashai or not? So there is a very simple answer. In Jainism, we are describing two types of rag, prasasta rag and aprasasta rag. Prasasta rag is one which downgrades you. Aprasasta rag is one which is good. Obviously, that has to be left again. Take example of Gautam Swami. Gautam Swami has attachment with Tirthankar Mahavir till the nirvana of Tirthankar Mahavir. And that did not allow him to have the Keval Gyan. And it's only after 
the nirvana of tirthankar mahavir this rag was had gone and this rag was uh, destroyed and then he gets uh, keval gyan to yes this is good but at the same time it will obstruct your ultimate uh, liberation so has to be left even at the end of the life the next question is who who are we to decide our rebirth which is natural here we have to understand that jainism discusses pancha samavaya that for any event to happen there are five things or five factors which are simultaneously present one which we call swabhava or nature the second which we call kala or time the third which we call is niyati that is destiny the fourth one which we call is purva karma or our previous karmas and the last one is called our present efforts or purushat so anything which happens in our life is not only because of our karmas but it is also because of our purushat our aim is to liberate ourselves because if we are born again and again we are bound to face the associated miseries with our birth so if we have purva karmas but if we put the efforts to destroy this purva karmas we'll get rid of the cycle of birth and death and that is what is considered as moksha so uh uh that is what uh, is very important uh, yes uh, our nature Oh, sorry our uh, destiny is one part but at the same time purushat is also to be uh, associated with that the next question is who are making this positive work positive world is there any ishwar is there any god is there any allah who makes this positive world obviously as i mentioned previously jainism does not believe in a creator god jainism does not believe that this creation has started at some point of time jainism believes that the creation is uh, beginningless and it is endless anadi ananta and it it works on law of nature as i discussed previously somebody has asked jiva in water yes we have to look to the water in two ways one that it has got innumerable microorganism in it that's one thing and second thing it itself is a jiva though we have not been very conclusively uh, proved as on today whether water is jiva or not but there are some characteristics which we have found and i had shown in my previous lecture also that there are experiment which shows that jiva has feeling there are experiment which is which is trying to show that uh, jiva has memory power so probably there might be a day when science may be able to prove what uh, jains have uh, our jain acharyas or tithankaras have said somebody asked about the wisdom and gyan is wisdom is gyan i one can say that if you add wisdom to your information information is knowledge and if you add uh, wisdom to that it is considered to be gyan but i am very specific about it the meaning of gyan is very simple that which leads to the liberation all other may be vyavahara gyan i am not saying the word that uh, you know the gyani who is gyani the gyani is one who is progressing on the path of liberation or moksha or mukti the person who knows a lot is not gyani the person who may not be knowing a lot but is on the path of liberation is gyani so definition of gyani has to be very clearly understood because sometimes we feel that oh my god the person who knows all the agamas and all they are gyani in a way in a way it's fine okay they are gyani but more than that the person who follows the path of liberation without even reading so much of literature 
is also considered to be jnani. So the understanding of jnani has to be very clear. Somebody asked about the air travel. Yes, we should avoid as much as we can because that's a very, uh, very important source of violence. Somebody has asked, what is what? Which are the one sense beings? Science also describes the unicellular organisms, which we call one sense beings. Jainism is very clear. The earth-bodied, air-bodied, water-bodied, fire-bodied, and vanaspati or plant-bodied jivas are considered to be one sensed organism. However, uh, recently. There are some number of, number of experiments where science, science, scientists, scientists are trying to show that plant does not have only touch, but it can also smell. So, you know, a lot of research is going on and let's see what, what comes out of that. But uh, science is trying to show that uh, plants are not one sensed organism, but they also have many more uh, uh, faculties of the senses. Uh, there's another question about the water only, the time limit for boiled water. Obviously, once the boiled water becomes cool, it's, an, it's a vibrant medium for the soul to enter into it because it's the most available, easy entity, which is called yoni. So we always feel that six to eight hours is, uh, is a time when water remains achet. The, you know, some people said whether we should put the ash or some people has said how to make alkaline. Now, these are not very important parts as far as Jainism is concerned. Jainism also says that you should not use the sachet water, try to use the achet water. Again, there is a difference of opinion about what is sachet and what is achet. Uh, somebody says that uh, sachet means one where there is a possibility of the soul to enter or soul or it's a yoni. It's a place where the soul will harbor itself. That is called sachet. Achet is one where the soul cannot harbor. So obviously uh, you have to go into the more detail about this. Somebody asked about the om. Om is, uh, you know, uh, Jainism has also accepted, uh, you know, ultimately let's understand that we are part of the Hindu culture. I'm not saying Hinduism. Try to understand. And what is Hindu culture? It encompasses all of a religion, whether it is a Sikh religion, whether it is a Buddha religion, it is Jain religion or Hindu religion or Vedic religion. It encom encompasses all things. So there are so many things common between all of us. Like Murti Puja. Murti Puja was very important part of uh, Hindu culture. So that came into our culture. There are the non-violence is part of Jain culture, which, which got into the Hindu culture. So there's so many things, you know, like when we get married, we get married with a Hindu Viti. I mean, obviously some people have started Jain Viti, but obviously there is no scripture references of Jain marriage Viti. We have, we have modified it is a different thing. So let's understand that we are part of an Hindu culture, Indus Valley culture. And there are so many things which are common between us and all other contemporary religions. And let's merge with each. I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, what is right and what is wrong and this should be done or this. But if you ask me, I would never like to identify, my, identify myself away from the Hindu culture. We are part of Hindu culture. We are all together for almost so many years. We, we have been staying very, uh, very closely with each other. We mingle with each other. And why do we separate, you know, from them and us? Why we try to even, you know, somebody is trying to many times prove that my, our religion is better than their religion. I think this time of comparison is counterproductive. We are staying in the society which is a multicultural society, multi-religious society. We have to respect all other, other people who are staying with us. Somebody may be believing in Rama, somebody may be believing in Krishna, somebody may be believing in Swami Narayan, somebody may be believing in other, other entities. It doesn't matter. That's fine. They all have their own faith. 
who are we to disturb their faith and who are we to say that their faith is inferior to our faith? We have our faith, they have their faith. So, ever, never try to discriminate ourselves from the Hindu tradition or the Hindu culture. We are all part of Hindu culture. Our belief at some points are different. But I'll tell you a very important thing. Purva Janma or rebirth, purification of the soul, the concept of mukti or concept of moksha and there are so many things which are so common between us there are very few things which are where we differ from each other so uh, let's not uh, ever think that we are not part of Hindu culture uh, there is a Chauviar versus other Jain food, yes <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, there are people who follow Chauviar but they don't take care of many more things which we are supposed to take care as far as our food habits are concerned. I again don't want to go into the details. But Chauviar is not only the sign of being Jain. It's one part of it. But daily what we eat since morning to evening, the outside food we eat, the contaminated food which we eat, the preserved food we eat, the food which is stored for many days, that's what we eat. If out of some social compulsion or family compulsion, it is fine. But we can't make that a habit. So these are the few things which we have to understand. I have tried to answer almost all the questions which were asked in last five days. There are some questions which I'm dropping because there are of no significance to me. I've got now very little time to rush on the uh, economy of Tetankar Mahavir. Uh, because now only six or seven minutes are remaining. But I'll try to show you some of my presentation, which I did on the uh, on the economic of Tirthankar Mahir. I'll go very fast and try to finish within 10 minutes. Uh, I was uh, asked to give a lecture in the Karnataka University about the economics of Lord Mahavir. So this is what I, I presented. And I'll just uh, go a little fast on this because our time is already over. So, economics of Tirthankar Mahavir. Uh, just one minute. Uh, slide slow. From the beginning. Okay. Uh, as I told you, this is the lecture which I prepared when uh, I went for the convocation of Karnataka University. And uh, that was a college where they were, uh, they were teaching finance. So, uh, this is what I presented. Uh, the economic of Lord Mavir focuses on Tyaga and Sayyam, not on Bhog and Parigraha. Lord Mavir taught us art of living, art of caring, and art of sharing. 2000 years, 2600 years back, what was the socio economic condition? of our country. It, that's what we are supposed to understand. I cannot go into the detail again because of the time. Titankar Mahavir's economy is economy of resources and equality. Mahavir's concept of economic were focused on availability of resources, creation of resources, utilization of resources, accumulation of resources, and sharing of resources. There are two types of resources, natural resources and man-made resources. He discussed all these points in so much detail that today also we can learn a lot from his, uh, uh, his concept. First, when uh, Tithagar Mahavir was there, at that time there was a lot of inequality caste hierarchy, women were considered unequal, there was a slavery, there was a divine between rich and poor, obviously many of these things are still persisting. Cheating in the name of religion, superstitious, fever, uh, sorry, fear and economic divide. The desires, the four des natural desires were there, which uh, Tithagar Mahavi described, Aar Sangya, Vai Sangya, Maithun Sangya, what his philosophy was, Sanyam, 
Mahir's philosophy on economics was Sayyam in creation of resources, minimum use of resources, minimum possession of resources, and the sharing of resources. He described two levels of uh, spiritual enlightenment, Shraman and Shravak. Samyak Darshan, Nan Charitrani Moksmark, right faith, right knowledge, and right conduct. And for that, he discussed three things, Marganusari, Shravakachar, and Shramanachar. In Marganusari, three important points are given, very important. The first one says, Nyaya Pajit Dhana. Nyaya Pajit Dhana. That means you can have as much as wealth you want to create, you can create it, but by honest, legal, and morally right method. Nyaya Pajit Dhana. That means or Nyaya Sampana Vaibhav. The another word which is used is Nyaya Sampana Vaibhav, which is given in our Marganusari. The second very important part which is given is Uchita Vyaya. That is, even if you have a large wealth, you should spend only that which is required. Don't think that, <laughs> I'm sorry, don't think that because you have a large money, you can spend the way you want to spend. No. Paropkara pari pravinata. Paropkara pravinata. That means you have to be benevolent and try to help the helpless and the destitute. So this is about the Marganusari. There are 35 rules of Marganusari. And that out of these, these are the three which are very important. Obviously, the fourth one I will be telling you afterwards, which is known as Punyanubandi Punya. In Shravakachar, when you follow Shravakachar, Obviously, whatever business you do, there should be non-violence. You cannot do any cheating or fraud. You have to respect the women working in your, in your, uh, in your business or in your office. You have to control your desires because in expanding your desires, there are sometimes you may do something which is not right. Dikkavirati you do limitation of areas of activities. Bhogopubhog Pariman, red signals against consumerism. Atithi Samvibhag, one distributes all his belongings to unknown before he takes monkhood. In Bhogopubhog Pariman, there are 15 types of businesses which are forbidden as far as the Jain is concerned. Obviously, he also discussed or he also said the, about the life in the earth, plant, air, water, and etc. So, our business should be very environmental friendly. It should not impact on the food, healthcare, and overall economy. Use less and so, share more with others. Jain diet, obviously, is very important for the physical and mental health. We already discussed in our uh, past few lectures. Jain community as a leading business community. Jain constitute less than 1% of India's population. Still, there is a substantial contribution to the society and economy as a whole. Jain business ethics with the belief that success or wealth is not only due to their efforts or intelligence, but they are due to punya or rewards of the meritorious deeds of their past lives. This makes them naturally self-motivated, charitable uh, attitude without any significant efforts. Mars economy thinks about GNH, gross national happiness, not uh, uh, GDP. So economics of uh, is an uh, is for the universal welfare. It is focusing on shavakachar, compassion. Both are inclusive. So, uh, because of the want of time, I can't go into the more detail. But it's very interesting to learn about the, the economics of Tirthankar Mahavir. Uh, one might say that obviously, you know, there is a socialism, there is a communalism, there is a capitalism, 
or there's a cooperative movements which were given by our uh, yug purush uh, mahatma gandhi but if you consider all these four standard practices of economics and against to consider the practice which dithankar mahavi taught us the practice of tyag and sanyam is probably something by which our uh, world would be benefited a lot so uh, thank you very much again i thank all of you who have been present for this swadhyay i thank uh, jaina the whole jaina team its president harish bhai and dilip bhai the mentor or the ex president of jaina for giving me this opportunity to express my views on the few subjects related to jainism i know this is the first effort of jaina to go globally and talk about uh, some of the aspects of jainism in simple english i know the time is short i know there are so many other limitations for which i cannot do full justice to the whole thing but at least we have tried to do whatever best we can do i again uh, thank all of you khamat khamna to all of you sab sata mein rahe and at the end sarva mangal mangalyam sarva kalyan karanam pradanam sarva dharmanam jainam jayati sasnam jainam jayati sasnam thank you depend by you have persevered presented these lectures for the last 7 days your only intention here is to spread jain dharma you've done so in india here in us in many other countries of africa singapore and europe i think you are a true shravak who has spent lifetime spreading jainism thank you and hopefully we'll hear from you again next for joseph thank you